So we aren't used to seeing Jesus in a less than flattering light. Yes, there are the familiar stories in the Bible. There's the story of Jesus flipping over the tables of the money changers in the temple. And Jesus did tell the Pharisees that they were like the inside of a whitewashed tomb. In anger, he told them that they were pretty to look at, but filled with the bones of dead people. Jesus even rebuked Peter, telling him, get behind me, Satan. But by all accounts, that was because Peter had questioned whether or not the crucifixion and resurrection was really necessary. Jesus even cursed a fig tree and made it wither and die. And so the stories of Jesus' very human capacity for anger do exist, but they seem to pale in comparison to today's gospel reading. Why in the world would Jesus refer to a woman as a dog? Why would he choose rudeness over compassion? Well, in the very first sentence of the reading, we hear that Jesus had just sort of snuck away to a house a fair distance away from where most of his ministry took place. And there it says he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Jesus was hiding. He was spent. He was in need of the quiet, far away from the crowds, both admirers and foes. He needed to get away from the questions that were meant both to enlighten and to challenge him. And I don't know about you, but the fact that Jesus was tired makes him utterly human and relatable to me. And it also helps me understand a little bit better the exchange that he's about to have in this reading with the woman who was desperate to heal her daughter. I accidentally stapled my page this morning. I need my notes for you all. So word leaked out about Jesus' presence in this small town, and his quiet time was not to be. People would have been at least curious who this man was. They would have heard the stories about him. And some of them, upon hearing of his miracles, would have done anything to get to him, which is exactly what happened. Jesus comes to this town, and the Gospel of Mark tells us that one woman in particular wasted no time in getting to him. She was so convinced that Jesus could save her daughter that she begged him to do so. And now, here, remembering everything that we know about Jesus, we expect him to do as is his custom. We expect him to offer a compassionate response and invite the girl to him, or perhaps go visit her at her home. What we don't expect is for Jesus to insult the woman and call her a dog. But that's exactly what he does. Almost inexplicably, that's what he does. And Mark tells us that the woman in question was Syrophoenician, that she was Greek and also Syrian of the Phoenician race, which is relevant because she would have been a pagan. The people in this region that, v that Jesus went to were considered heathens by the Jews. They were infidels, idolaters, non-believers. She was, Jesus points out, unclean, like a mongrel dog. And we can't even comfort ourselves by thinking that maybe Jesus was referring to cute puppies or household pets. He simply wasn't. She was unclean, religiously speaking, and he was here to serve the Jews, first and foremost. And so what, it makes what happened next all the more remarkable. Because without missing a beat, this unclean woman replies to Jesus that even the dogs eat the crumbs under the table. Hmm. Now you have our attention. This woman, determined to help her daughter, sought the one that she knew could heal her, 
she wasn't a Jewish woman, and it's likely that she had her own gods, her own idols that she had probably been praying to. She would have been accustomed to praying to them for situations like this, and it's likely that it wasn't doing a darn thing to heal her daughter. And so here, in her very own town, almost unbelievably, here stood Jesus, the Messiah that she had heard about. His reputation preceded him. She had heard of his miracles. She knew he had cast out demons. She knew he had raised people from the dead. She'd heard about the crowds that followed him to hear his teachings. And she was drawn to him above all others. She was a woman, and women did not approach men in this way. She was Jew not Jewish, and Jewish men did not converse with non-Jews in this manner. Other accounts of this story in the Bible say that the woman was actually chasing after Jesus, shouting to get his attention. She clearly did not care what other people thought. She would do anything, risk embarrassment, ignore social customs, act indecorous and unbecoming of a woman. I think we can rightly assume that she wouldn't have made such a spectacle of herself if she didn't believe with every fiber of her being that Jesus could heal her precious daughter. Perhaps you've had similar situations when you've made a spectacle of yourself because you knew what one of your children needed. Her child needed Jesus. Such faith. And then after she had literally begged Jesus to take the demon out of her, out of her daughter, and Jesus, in essence, had turned her down, she dared to argue. With the odds stacked against her, she pushed forward. When she got knocked down by life circumstances and criticism, she got back up. When others told her to quit because she was wasting Jesus' time, she continued to ask. And finally, in the face of an insult from this great man, she bowed and said, you are right. My daughter and I are dogs, and even we must eat. Such humility. And we should never confuse humility with weakness. This mother is a courageous warrior fighting for her child, and yet she humbly submitted to Jesus. Pride would have been offended by the dog comment. Pride would have returned insult for insult, and pride would have likely gone away feeling angered, indignant, and empty-handed. The Bible says God rejects the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And aren't these the very same qualities that are the tenets of our faith? Tenacity, persistence, humility, not caring about what people think? It would be easy to write this story off as simply an anomaly of Jesus' ministry. It's true, he was uncharacteristically rude. And the truth is, we don't know why. Some scholars think he was being sarcastic in an effort to point out the ways in which society casts out certain people. Some scholars say it was foreshadowing that the Gentiles would also eventually receive Christ, and some think it was a test to see how strong her faith was, or how well she understood this almost riddle-like statement about feeding the children before the dogs. If it was a test, she passed. But if we simply say that Jesus was being human, as we all are, and in that human moment he was caught with his compassion down, then that is to say that Jesus broke every single rule that he ever taught us. Every truth he ever spoke, every admonition for us to be kind-hearted and compassionate and actively helping those in need, this one act of kindness, if we thought that's what it truly was, defies all of what Jesus taught. And so I don't buy that. I think this is a story about persistence, about how one mother's brokenness broke Jesus. 
It's the story of a desperate woman begging, even as a dog begs. And in this act of desperation and submission and pleading, her plight causes Jesus to change course. We don't know what might have happened had the woman simply turned and walked away when Jesus rejected her the first time, full of hurt pride, anger, maybe even self-loathing. We don't know because that's not what happened. What happens is the woman stands her ground and Jesus seems moved. If you've ever witnessed an eight-year-old pestering his parents to buy his favorite toy for him, you know the meaning of persistence. And that's the kind of persistence we're talking about, relentless pursuit. How would the Syrophoenician woman have felt if she had known Jesus was in her village, she knew that he was just steps away and had the ability to heal her daughter, and yet she was too afraid of what people would think or of offending someone? or of not being good enough, or religious enough, or the right social standing. She needed the persistence of an eight-year-old in this instance. She needed to be relentless. And she didn't say, as many people do today, and probably did then, okay, if you are the son of God, heal my daughter. She didn't throw out a challenge like that to Jesus. She simply said, you can do this. I know it. There may have been times in your own lives when you felt that if you were persistent, you might have been seen as too pushy, but not to God. I don't think you can ever be too pushy with God. Take Jacob, for example. In the Old Testament, Jacob wrestled in the desert with an angel. And when the angel started to leave, Jacob had the audacity to tell him not to. He said, you're not leaving until you give me a blessing. And so the angel blessed Jacob. Or what about the bleeding woman in the New Testament who followed Jesus in a crowd of people, people who wouldn't even stand near her. They shunned her. They thought she was so unclean that they wouldn't be near her. Yet she pushed through the crowd, believing that if she could just touch Jesus' cloak, she would be healed. And Jesus himself tells us a story in the book of Luke. He tells the story of a woman who was widowed. And back in Jesus' day, Widows had certain rights and privileges that, according to the law, they were given. But there was a judge, Jesus says, who refused to treat this woman's case justly. The judge didn't follow God, and Jesus says he didn't care what people thought. So he just did what he wanted. And for some reason, what he wanted was to not give this woman her due. But she was persistent. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She kept going back demanding justice be done from the judge. And finally, the judge said, if she's going to keep coming back to me day after day after day and bothering me, I will grant her justice. So Jesus tells the story of the widow to his disciples and asks them a rhetorical question. He says, if the judge, who didn't even care about this woman, finally granted her justice because of her persistence, don't you think God will bring about justice to those who cry out to him night after night after night. The gospel says, Jesus told them this story so that they might pray always and not lose heart. Have faith in the power of persistent prayer. Let me say this, though. Persistency cannot be used to limit God to the frame of our own thinking. There are times that God's answer is no because he has a greater purpose, and he grants us grace in those moments to move on with life as it is. Remember that even Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he was killed. God, if there is any way, take this cup from me, Jesus prayed. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Three times Jesus prayed that there would be another way out of this. And all three times, he submitted to the will of God. See, our prayers are powerful. They are important. They are hard. And sometimes they come from really broken places in our lives. And still, 
we are called to be filled with faith that God's will is bigger than anything we can imagine. And if you persist and persist in your prayers, and you still insist that there's no result, then I would ask you, how do you feel in those moments of prayer versus the moments of worrying and wondering and thinking about giving up? The Syrophoenician woman humbled herself before God, accepted that he had his reasons for what he did, even though she wasn't privy to them. And then she dared to push back. Even the dogs eat what falls from the table, she said. And with that astute reply, Jesus conceded. Because you said this, you may go, he said. The demon has left your daughter. The truth is, the words that we speak in times of crisis expose the degree of our faith, our humility, our persistence. Our words affect our reactions to the problem. It's important that we speak the right words because they become the outcome of our prayers. Sending up one lone powerful prayer is awesome. It's good. It's life-changing maybe even. But it's also a bit like saying you went to physical therapy one time after knee replacement, and now you can't figure out why you don't walk straight. There's benefit. The primary purpose of this story is to inspire us not to give up just because the hill is difficult to climb. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Don't take no for an answer. Tenacity reinforces our need for God. The more we turn to God, the more connected we are to God, and the more we begin to rely on God. Put another way, the great Aristotelian motto, everything in moderation, doesn't really apply when it comes to conversations with God. More is definitely better sometimes. The Syrophoenician woman's dogged insistence that Jesus help her daughter was what it took. She gambled her reputation what little there was of it, and took a chance that Jesus would do what she believed he could do. And Jesus, in turn, took a chance on her. 